Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Today, we have a very exciting interview with Dr. Joe Pizzorno, one of the founders of the functional medicine movement. Our topic today is the importance of micronutrients, of physiological phytonutrients, and specific forms of vitamins and minerals that are often underappreciated. And these are often eliminated by modern agriculture and not included when synthetic vitamins are simply added back to processed foods. When plants are hybridized to increase levels of certain micronutrients, there is often a decrease in the production of other nutrients. Our modern food supply grown with genetically modified seeds and with many chemicals has lost many phytonutrients. When when crops are sprayed with herbicides, to control weeds and pesticides to protect from insects, viruses, and molds, the plants lose the ability to resist these naturally. This is why many natural phytochemicals may have antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral properties, as well as being able to, uh, as well as being anti-insect, anti-herbivore, and antioxidant. When foods are refined, the simplification of research on vitamins has often not appreciated. The subtleties of the differences between what's found in nature, such as the family of nutrients found in wheat germ oil, known as alpha, beta, gamma, and delta tocopherols and alpha, beta, gamma, and delta tocotrienols, as opposed to stripping out a synthetic vitamin, alpha tocopherol, and studying that and ignoring the rest of the family and other phytonutrients that are present in in wheat germ oil, including some that have yet to be studied. Dr. Pizzorno referred to these as unimportant molecules found in our food at a presentation that he gave at the Institute of Functional Medicine annual meeting this year, which was a great meeting. Furthermore, the loss of these micronutrients from our food is associated with chronic diseases and diseases resulting from genetic variations referred to as single nucleotide polymorphisms. Therefore, it makes sense to increase our consumption of these important, unimportant molecules, quote unquote, unimportant molecules by eating organically grown plants and taking the right nutritional supplements. Our special guest today is Dr. Joe Pizzorno, who will be talking about this very important topic. Dr. Prisorno is one of the most important naturopathic doctors, educators, researchers, and one of the founding members of the functional medicine movement. Dr. Prisorno has written or co-authored more than 12 books, including the Encyclopedia of Natural Medicine, which has now sold over 2 million copies, the textbook of natural medicine, natural medicine for the prevention and treatment of cancer, the toxin solution, and co-author of Clinical Environmental Medicine. He's also the editor of the Integrative Medicine Journal. Dr. Pizzorno, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Dr. Ben, thank you for your very kind introduction and excellent overview of my presentation. Good, so before we get into the topic for today, since you're one of the founders of the functional medicine movement, where do you think functional medicine is right now? Well, thank you. I'm um, happy to have contributed to the evolution of this body of knowledge. So I think functional medicine is doing very, very well right now. Uh, we've developed very good educational programs. We're now starting to get some research uh, evaluation of what we're doing. And worldwide interest in, in functional medicine is just exploding. And it's not surprising because, as you know, we now suffer the highest burden of chronic disease in every age group ever in human history. So. Right. Not only the public is realizing there's a need to think differently, but so are doctors. Yes, yes. I think uh, just look at what's happened in the last month where almost simultaneously we have a a new drug for Alzheimer's gets approved 
which actually does nothing to reverse the condition at all. Doesn't cure anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe slows down the, the progression in a percentage of people. Unfortunately, you know, 30 to 40% of them end up with uh, swelling or uh, inflammation of, or, or bleeding in their brain. Um, and at, almost at the exact same time, a functional medicine study uh, is published um, by Dr. Dale Bredesen showing that using a functional medicine approach of diet, lifestyle, exercise, targeted in nutraceuticals, um, that we can actually reverse cure people of Alzheimer's. So I think we're reaching a point where some of these drugs are, are, are just not really adequate responses to the chronic conditions of today and functional medicine is starting to show itself to be a much more effective solution. Uh, well said. <clears throat> Something I've started to realize is a kind of a useful approach to think about these new drugs, as well as new natural interventions, is numbers needed to treat for benefit and numbers needed to treat for adverse effects. And so many of these drugs, when it's all of this latest, greatest thing, you look at, well, how many people have to be treated to get benefit? And it's like 40, 100 people before somebody gets a benefit. Right. Well, that doesn't sound great. Well, how many need to be treated before you get an adverse event? Three, four, <laughs> okay. So your adverse events are more likely than clinical benefit. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not anti-drug, but I'm anti-drugs, which have more damage than benefit. And so many of the new drugs, they're so little benefit left for the drug approach that the returns are, are becoming less and less and more and more expensive. Oh, yeah. That new drug for Alzheimer's is only $56,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> Works great for the drug companies, um, but exactly. and, and really desperate people might give it a try, but we already know how to prevent Alzheimer's disease. And we even know some things about how to actually start to reverse it a bit. So the drug approach it's great in some areas, but not so good for everyday health. So let's start with vitamin E, um, okay. it, it, which really started in, in a lot of ways with the research on the benefits of wheat germ oil, which Correct. was fairly robust in its benefits for right. preventing cardiovascular disease, infertility, and, and other things. So let me step back and kind of contextualize this a bit. Okay. So remember that our research on nutrition is only about 100 years old. I mean, you, you can find some examples earlier, like, you know, vitamin C and British sailors, things like this. But in terms of really good quality laboratory diving into this, we didn't have the tools until about 100 years ago to actually start looking at well, what in food is important. So the researchers were limited, one, by our lack of understanding of biochemistry, but also by the tools that are, were available. And they pretty much had to look at food and determine, well, what things in food are necessary for animals to continue to live. So it's all about what's necessary. So we call them vitamins, life, okay? What vitamins are required for living? What minerals are required for living? What amino acids are required for life? And we came up with, um, well, it turns out 43 molecules uh, as being important, molecules and minerals, okay? And so that was defined as what's important in food. And so we decided that everything else in food was not important. That's why my facetious name, unimportant molecules. Right. So you might say, okay, well, fine. So there's 43 molecules in food. Uh, let's say 50, okay, for, for round numbers. How many other molecules are there in food that we decide were unimportant? Well, it turns out there's about 50,000 molecules in food. So we decided 99.9% .9 was unimportant. Now we start seeing this, this research, which has been coming out last oh, 20 years or so, of these, oh, well, look at these interesting molecules that um, are in food. And we're given all these fancy names like phytonutrients. Oh, you take this phytonutrient and look at all these benefits. Ignoring the fact that they were in the food supply until we started modifying the food supply with hybridizations and CMOs and uh, chemical farming and such. And they got lost from the food supply. Now we'll get it back to people. So, so we, 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 we damaged the food supply causing disease and then we extract out and come back and say, oh, well, let's look at this particular molecule. Let's modify it a little bit, make it patentable, give it back to people as a new wonder drug. Well, it was in the food to begin with. Right. How, how's, that, how's that progress? And it shouldn't be surprising that we end up with all these disappointing trials on uh, DL alpha tocopherol. Yes. 
Yeah, so now let's go back to the next one. So there's, there's a really interesting book. I think, um, now, is your audience primary consumers or doctors um, or healthcare professionals? It means more towards practitioners, but okay. there are certainly uh, educated consumers who listen as well. Great. Okay. I love talking to this particular group. Okay. So there's a book by uh, Bricknell and Prescott published 50 years ago where they compiled a lot of the research in nutrition that was available at the time. And it's fascinating when you read through this book. Now, it's not always true in every factor, but what you tend to see is when the research was being done on a food concentrate like wheat germ oil, they got all these really good results. Then they decide, oh, now it's only this particular component that's important. Then all the research went from there. And you see the clinical results drop dramatically. So then they say, oh, well, the d which is a synthetic form of just one of the eight vitamin E you know, versions, uh, well, it didn't work. Therefore, vitamins don't work. <laughs> but wait a minute, wait a minute. You only tested one synthetic version, which are not actually found in nature, and use that to then discredit the whole field of vitamins. So what happened with the wheat germ, with, with the wheat germ oil is they got benefit, synthesized out one particular aspect, didn't get benefit and threw out the whole field. But in reality, we look back at the whole food extract, which is concentrating the family of foods, that's where you get the benefit. And so much of our modern food supply has been losing these other molecules that are so critical because you say, well, they weren't important. So when you, when you change the food supply to lose these molecules, well, since they weren't important, it doesn't matter. What happens? All this disease. Exactly. So these molecules were necessary for health, right. not for life. So what, what should we get out of this wheat germ oil vitamin E story? What, what should we think about as the most important um, ways to get uh, the vitamin E family into our body? Or should we, there's actually been some interesting research on tocotrienols and then, you know, um, uh, perhaps using tocopherols uh, with more of a gamma heavy focus or using tocotrienols or using them at different times of day or going back to wheat germ oil. What do you think is, where, where are we with all that? So uh, great. So let's start with a, a quote from, how about Hippocrates? Let your foods be your medicines and your medicines your foods. Right. Great concept. But it has to be real food. And what I mean by that, it means real food is heirloom type seeds. So they have not been hybridized too much grown organically so that they have all these important molecules and of course then stored properly so you don't contaminate them with um, chemicals leaching from plastics into the food like supply. You mean like Kellogg's flakes? <laughs> <laughs> right. So you remember, you know, when Kellogg started, it was whole grains. Right. Now look at what you've got, all this synthetic stuff with right. lots of chemicals. And then okay. you go back in some uh, synthetic folic acid and a few mm -hmm. other vitamins. So anyway, so when we're looking at uh, all these food molecules, there's no substitute for, for real food. Now, having said that, there's plenty of roles for vitamins. Okay, so going back to the, uh, the vitamin E. So when you look at the clinical research, so it turns out that when you look at animals, well, alpha-tocopherol was more, most important based on the field reabsorption assay. So what this was, so they took uh, pregnant rats, they put them on a vitamin E deficient diet and the uh, rats absorbed their fetuses. When they then gave them various kinds of vitamin E, they found that alpha-tocopherol prevented the resorption of the fetus. So therefore they decided that was the only important vitamin E. When you look at human research, it turns out that the gamma tocopherol is way more important than the alpha tocopherol. I wanna be clear, all the tocopherols are important, but gamma tocopherol is more important. So when you start doing research using large amounts of d tocopherol or more healthy, uh, the alpha tocopherol, when you give high dosages of one vitamin E, you decrease the absorption of the other vitamin E's. So what happens is you start getting studies that show not only no benefit, but sometimes even uh, uh, detriment from using high doses of a single version of a vitamin. So taking a vitamin, a multivitamin, for example, that has uh, alpha tocopherol uh, could potentially, if it's in high enough dosages, decrease absorption of gamma tocopherol, which is probably yes. more important. Yes. Yeah. And the same thing happens with the uh, flavonoids, for example. So you get people, I'm talking carotenoids too. So you look at, get people a high dose of beta carotene. Well, beta carotene is only one of hundreds of carotenes in the food supply. 
and we give people high levels of beta carotene, you saturate the absorption sites, and you get low levels of the other carotenoids, many of which are more important. So for example, for men, well, you know, the, the, uh, the lycopene is really important. When you give people high doses of beta carotene, you make it harder to absorb the lycopene that men need for the prostate. There's just so many examples. Interesting. What do you think about the latest research on the tocotrienols, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of the vitamin E family? But, so, of course, it's part of the food supply. We evolved expecting those molecules to be in the food supply. You take about the food supply and give it back to people and say, oh, wow, isn't this wonderful? <laughs> well, it should have been there in the, to be, begin with, okay? Now, I'm not saying don't do it, but look back at your food. Eat real food. I, I can't emphasize this enough. It's, and I've, <laughs> it's, it's hard to get real food. Where do you get heirloom food grown from heirloom seeds? Right. So something that I've noticed, um, where my wife and I have decided to make the investment in growing more and more of our own food. So I actually spent a significant amount of time there, my time now voting, uh, growing our own food. So, so many times we've compared um, chemically grown foods that's what I'm calling it. It's not conventionally grown foods. I'm calling them chemically grown foods, okay? Because I want conventionally grown to be organic. You compare, for example, tomato. I, I like that because it's such a great example. And we like the uh, cherry tomatoes. So uh, just do, do it yourself. Go to the store, buy a chemical grown cherry tomato, buy an organically grown cherry tomato, and grow a cherry tomato of your own and compare them. There's no comparison. So yes, the organically grown tomato is way better than the chemically grown tomato, but I'll tell you, my homegrown organically grown tomatoes are way better than store-bought organically grown tomatoes. Why is that? So when I say it tastes better, why, what's that mean? Well, taste means we're sensing more molecules. And we look at these, more, these other molecules, these more diverse molecules, they have all these beneficial effects in our bodies. Yeah, it's not easy though to grow a lot of fruits and vegetables on your own without using any chemicals. I gave up every time I would get these tomatoes. I'd have these great green tomatoes, and I'd want to leave them on until they turn red. And by the time they turn red, they got eaten by something. <laughs> right. Um, yes, it, so, it's not not not. Yes, you have to. It, it's a lot not easy. Work. I've really been enjoying this discussion, but I'd like to take a minute to tell you about a new product that I'm very excited about. I'd like to tell you about a new wearable called the Apollo. And this is a device that can be worn on the wrist or the ankle, and it uses vibrations to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. And this device has amazing benefits in terms of uh, getting you out of that stressed out sympathetic nervous system and stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. It has a number of different functions, especially helping you to relax, to focus, to concentrate, to get into a deeper meditative state, even to help you sleep. And there's even a mode to help you wake up. And this all occurs through the uh, scientific use of subtle vibrations. Uh, for those of you who might be interested in getting the Apollo for yourself to help you uh, reset your nervous system, go to apolloneuro.com and use the um, affiliate code WHITES10. That's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z-10. And now back to the discussion. Whereas uh, folic acid is synthetic, natural folates are found mm -hmm. in, in many foods. Uh, maybe you can talk about uh, this family of, or you can talk about this family of B vitamins. So let me just make a, a complimentary comment. I work really hard producing these lectures and it is so gratifying to see someone like yourself dive into them and understand what I was saying. I mean, it's just so, so good to hear, okay? Because well, I know. I, know. Lecture, I thought, wow, this, this is really amazing. And then I thought, what is he really talking about? Unimportant, you know, so I had to go through the slides several times and the more I went through it, it was more like a, going through a Shakespearean play where it was, oh, there's another layer here. And so that's why I thought it was important to read the intro to get people to start thinking about this and, and dive into it. Um, thank you. That, well, well said. So folic acid is a great example of how off track we got. So when you look at food, there's no folic acid in food. All you have are folates and typically methylated folates. Okay. So as we've refined our, our food supply, 
we have lost the natural folates from the food supply. For example, look at wheat. You remember that slide. So here's how much natural folates are in wheat. Well, then you uh, grow the wheat synthetically, and then you process it into bread, and they let it sit on the shelf for a while. And by the time the wheat actually gets to people, there's almost no folates left in it. So that results in things like neural tube defects and all kinds of other, you know, elevated homocysteine, which, you know, causes Alzheimer's and everything else. So what did we do? We gave people folic acid. Okay, well, the good news is folic acid definitely decreased the side of the adverse events of our having decreased amount of folates in the food supply. But there's a big problem here, and that is folic acid is not actually used by the body. It has to be methylated. And that's where you have these MTHFR polymorphisms. A substantial portion of the population, one quarter, one third, uh, don't do that very well. I, even so the fo- I think it's more than 50%, actually. Yeah, it may, it may be that high. I'm trying to be a little conservative here, okay? <laughs> anyway, so they don't make that conversion. So, or they make the conversion poorly. So now we're getting too much, too high levels of folic acid in the body that's not normally there, and it itself becomes problematic. So now let's go back to food supply. The food supply has natural methylated folates in it. So they don't have to be converted through MTHFR, uh, and you don't have to worry about the polymorphisms. So this whole polymorphism problem came about because we so distorted the food supply and lost the natural folates in the food supply. And, and in fact, um, uh, while um, you know, some of the research on just folic acid, once again, just like vitamin E, you know, it was supposed to be this uh, super protective uh, vitamin and it would prevent cancer. And then some of the studies showed that it increased cancer. And so all of a sudden, everybody was like, oh my God, what do we do? And the reality is, is while synthetic folic acid which often is unmetabolized and builds up, may increase cancer risk. Um, natural folate is actually protective against cancer. Yes, yes. That, that, when I found that study, I was, was and there are several studies now, I was really uh, intrigued uh, because they're showing that indeed, the natural folates, there's an inverse correlation between levels of natural folates in the blood and many kinds of cancers. But there's unfortunately in some, some cancer, particularly it's like colon cancer, a positive correlation between folic acid levels in the blood and the cancer. So I'll be real clear. People listening to this might become fearful of vitamins. No, it's, that's not the issue. So the issue is number one is eat real food. And number two is when you're taking vitamins, make sure they're the natural forms of the vitamins, not the synthetic forms of the vitamins. Now, sometimes synthetics can be the same as natural, and that's just fine. But so many times, the synthetic forms of the vitamins are different molecules, and that's where we run into trouble. Right. So on folic acid, you want your supplement to contain uh, natural folates. It should say yes. uh, methylfolate or natural right. folate, right? Rather yes, than exactly. folic acid. Exactly. You don't want folic acid. Right. So um, another topic you mentioned is uh, mycorrhiza. Mm-hmm. which is, uh, most people don't realize this, but the soil where food is grown um, actually has this network of a fungus that runs through it that gives integrity and, and importance to uh, that soil. Mm-hmm. Perhaps you can talk about this. Yeah, that, that's also fascinating. And my wife, uh, who also is involved in medicine, made an interesting comment. She said, we're all now very aware of how disruptions in the natural bacteria in our gut result in disease. Well, what happens if you have disruption in natural bacteria and fungus and you know these rhizomes and such in the soil? Won't that affect the health of the plant? And the answer turns out to be yes. So let's look at glyphosate as a good example. So glyphosate is now fairly widely spread, uh, um, at widespread use in the food supply. And For the reason it's so widely know, spread- It's the main ingredient in Roundup, right. which is a, a herbicide used to grow many foods. People use it on their lawns to kill weeds. Yes, exactly. So, and it's thought it's safe for humans because it poisons something called the shikimic pathway, which is only found in plants. It's not found in humans. So therefore it's not a dangerous de- chemical for humans. Okay, well, that's a matter of debate, but let's ignore that for a second. <laughs> and really, by the way, if your audience is not aware of it, Roundup is only 50% glyphosate. It's 50% of 
uh, undisclosed ingredients, uh, which are typic typically way more toxic than the glyphosate. Okay, but we won't get to that right now. Okay. Let's just stick with glyphosate. So the glyphosate disrupts the microbial balance in the soil. And when you disrupt the micro uh, microbial balance in the soil, the plants start making fewer of these unimportant molecules. In addition, may these, uh, these um, uh, flavonoids that are so important for our health are, are made through the shikimit pathway, these polyphenols and such. So the plants are making less of these unimportant molecules. And those unimportant molecules, when they go down in our body, the amount of disease goes up. So by disrupting, making the plants less healthy, we're making ourselves less healthy. Interesting. And, you know, and, and let, me, let me go further with that. Yeah. You, you, you may bring up again, but this is a good point yeah, to bring right. it up. So I've been really fascinated by the increasing and worried by the increasing incidence of epidemics and pandemics in our society. It directly correlates with growing foods chemically because we grow foods chemically. Pandemic? Who's ever heard of a pandemic? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So we grow foods chemically, they have less of these bioflavonoids. Now, why are these bioflavonoids being produced by the plants? Because they're antiviral. So plants are producing the bioflavonoids to protect themselves from viruses. So when we eat them, we're protected from viruses as well. But what happens when they're not there anymore? Oh, all of a sudden we're more susceptible to viral infections. Gee, could it be that we made our population so susceptible to infection that we're going to be seeing more and more of these. And I want to say, while vaccinations have their place, isn't it better to not get the disease to begin with rather than wait for somebody to develop a vaccination with unknown long-term adverse effects? And, and develop and strengthen your immune system. So if you do come into contact with the virus, your body will be able to fight it off. Yes, exactly. And think about the, a person eating um, organically grown food, particularly rich in plant molecules, in plant, you know, plant-based diet, they're gonna have a lot of these antiviral molecules in the blood. So guess what? When the virus tries to get in, not only do we have our mucous membranes to protect us, not only do we have the innate and antibody-based immune systems to protect us, we all have all these antiviral molecules as well. You think about the advantage for our immune system, if the antiviral levels block or sl slow down the replication of the virus, say for a day or a couple of days. Well, look at that head start our immune system gets. Yeah. It's interesting. We're, we're talking about fungus and the importance of fungus, and we're talking about soil. And I think it's an interesting analogy to think about the microbiome, which is the soil in our guts, where um, all these beneficial um, microorganisms grow. And there's been a lot of talk, uh, as you know, about the bacteria and which are the best bacteria to grow there. And um, there's just been a ton of research, but we really haven't uh, delved that much into the importance of the fungi that are there. Mm -hmm. And yes. we, we talk a lot about there being too high levels of fungi, too high levels of candida, et cetera. And that can certainly be a problem, but there can be a problem not having enough fungi. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not only is there a microbiome, there's, you know, there's a micro fungum um, and, and, uh, and at some point we'll realize that there are viruses that are probably an important part of our, um, microbiome as well as, uh, parasites. Yes. Yes. Well, well said we, as we evolved as a species, you know, our guts were, are colonized by a wide range of organisms and we developed these relationships with them, okay? And uh, the ones that causes disease we got rid of and the ones that were commensural and helped us be healthy, we, we stuck with. But right. then we screwed things up by giving people antibiotics, which are nonspecific and by um, giving animals these antibiotics. And now we're starting to develop these new groups of organisms, which we did not evolve with and have a lot of negative effects in our body. And the pesticides that we spray on the plants also kill the bacteria and yes. non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that, yes. that damage our guts on and on and on. Yes. Um, so um, you mentioned organic heirloom plants. Um, yes. Can you explain what heirloom plants are and, and how can we, where can we get these? 
Yeah, it's it's a it's a good, it's a very good question. And it's not only the heirloom plants or foods we eat, but also heirloom herbal medicines. Okay, okay. it's another interesting topic. So, looking at the uh, heirloom seeds, so just just think about this kind of logically. If you take a, a seed and you then um, well, let's ignore CM, GMOs, things like that. Let's just say we as farmers, well, farmers tend to pick the seeds that will produce the biggest crop, uh, the crop with the most protein in it, or the crop with one, whatever particular characteristic you want more of. And so you hybridize and hybridize and hybridize, get more and more of the characteristics that you want. Well, remember, plants have limited physiological function. And if you start forcing one pathway of physiological functions, necessarily the plant's going to have less energy to produce those other pathways to other molecules that we decide were not important. So the further we can go back in our uh, gathering of seeds, the less likely we've hybridized them to a point where we've lost too many of these unimportant molecules. I facetiously call them unimportant molecules. I'm wondering if I need to come up with a better name <laughs> because while it grabs attention, it also kind of gives the wrong orientation. But the reality is that we're losing these other molecules because of hybridization. So where do you get these uh, heirloom seeds? The good news is that there are a number of resources for doing that. Uh, there's a place um, uh, here in Washington State called uh, Uprising Seeds, and I get my seeds from them. But then once I get the original seeds from them, if I have a successful crop and we like the food, we then harvest its seeds. So now these seeds are a little more wild, okay, because you know they, they've interacted with nature, and, and so now we're starting ourselves kind of going back a little, going back a little bit to get a little more and more um, diverse seeds, you might say. And that, that's that's really super important, and that's something that farmers did for thousands of years yes. until we started getting genetically modified seeds. And one of the things built into genetically modified seeds is that those seed, those plants from the genetically modified seeds will not produce seeds that can be replanted. So you have to continue to buy genetically modified seeds from the company that you bought them from originally. Mm. Yes, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, and so what this means is you're getting plants that are more and more further away from nature and are going to probably have less and less of those phytonutrients. Yep, exactly. And and then subsistence farmers in places like Africa and, and other parts of the world end up in a bad cycle where now they can't harvest their own seeds and they're forced to continue to buy seeds from these companies that are selling them these genetically modified seeds. Yes, no, it's, not, it's not good for the world. It's just, I mean, on the one hand, they say, well, look, we, we're, we're able to grow with these GMOs uh, food in areas that uh, had in, inadequate water, where the case may be. Well, you can see some of those strategies are a good idea, but stop pretending there's not a price associated with them and stop making these seeds that require now people to, you know, keep buying them because they can no longer reproduce themselves. It's, it, they use good, good, good reasons for it but then what they actually do is actually pretty bad. Right, and, and um, I, I, something just came through my mind. I always make these bizarre associations, but um, I, I know we're talking about plants, but uh, let's just talk about animals for a minute. And in order to um, make sure people have enough um, animal protein to eat, uh, leaving aside the um, <laughs> debate as to whether or not we need animal protein, um, I, they're now, making synthetic meat, not, yes. there's no animal involved at all. They're just growing meat in a yes. lab. And you can imagine, you know, what, whatever uh, benefits there are in say grass fed beef. And I mm -hmm. think there are many for the right person in the right mm -hmm. situation. Um, those are not going to exist in uh, meat grown in a lab. Yes. Um, you can come up with all kinds of ethical reasons for why it's good to grow meat in the lab, but it's not going to be a healthy food I mean, over the long term. I mean, short term, yeah, fine. But in the long term, it's not going to have these other, other molecules. And I'm going to say something which may offend some of your audience, but uh, when you think about how to farm foods, what do you think about growing foods in an incredibly synthetic environment of uh, the uh, water, grown just in water. You know, you put these these um, 
uh, screens up. You grow the food on the screens with a very con carefully controlled water. And uh, you put into water what you think is important. You grow these foods that look nice but you're not aware of all these other molecules. So control, growing food in these really synthetic environments doesn't seem like such a great idea. This is called hydroponics. Sounds like a good idea, but is that really the food you want to be eating? Right. Yeah, the soil is important. Soil is critically important. important. Yeah, just like your microbiome. Think of it like that. Yes. Um, you mentioned in your talk about uh, protecting the DNA from arsenic and, and mm -hmm. other heavy metals. Maybe you can talk about that. You really got my lecture. <laughs> this is so great. <laughs> okay. okay. So, you know, I've been involved in medicine now for literally over half a century. Okay. So I've, 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 I've learned a lot. And over that period of time, you get to see patterns. Okay. And uh, one of the areas that really grabbed my attention about 10 years ago was the effect of environmental toxins on our health. And I'm now going around the world literally lecture, uh, lecturing that environmental toxins have become the primary drivers of disease. But it's not just the environmental toxins, it's in the context of the severe distortion of our food supply. So, you know, we, we're really smart, we recognize, well, I mean, got, got smart enough to recognize, well, lead was a problem. So we stopped putting lead into the environment. Then we recognized DDT was a problem, got rid of that. We recognized PCBs were a problem, uh, decreased those. I mean, these are all good public health ventures. But we haven't done much about arsenic. And I, was, I was kind of surprised because I was looking at the research. Arsenic is actually the worst toxin we're being exposed to right now, and probably even worse than lead and, and PCBs and DDT. So I was thinking, well, if arsenic is so bad, why isn't it getting more attention? Then I wonder to myself, could it be that arsenic is now more toxic than it used to be? And I thought, well, could, all these bioflavonoids I'm noticing are leaving the food supply, these other molecules, do they, could that be part of the reason? So I had a, a researcher from last year, you know, a student come to me and say, oh, I want to work with you, Dr. Pizzorno. I said, okay, fine, here, why don't you go into research and look at, do bioflavonoids have an impact on arsenic toxicity? So it turns out that bioflavonoids are really important for protecting our DNA from arsenic. So what happens when you have increasing levels of arsenic in the, in the population, which by the way, the, the data is very clear, arsenic levels have actually gone up, but you have decreased levels of flavonoids that protect us from the arsenic. So all of a sudden now you're seeing arsenic playing a much bigger role in disease than in the past. So it's a combination of not only increased exposure to toxins, but decreasing the ability to protect ourselves from those toxins. And that's where we're getting all this disease. I'd like to interrupt this fascinating discussion we're having for another few minutes to tell you about another really exciting product that has changed my life and the life of my family, especially as it pertains to getting good quality sleep. It's something called the Chili Pad. C-H-I-L-I-P-A-D. It can be found at the website, chilisleep.com, which is C-H-I-L-I-S-L-E-E-P.com. And so this product involves a water-cooled mattress pad that goes underneath your sheets and helps you maintain a constant temperature at night. If you've ever gotten woken up because the temperature has uh, change typically goes, uh, gets warmer. Um, this product will maintain your body at a very even temperature and it tends to promote uninterrupted quality, um, deep and REM sleep, which is super important for healing and for overall health. And if you, um, if you go to chillysleep.com and you use the affiliate code whites, 20, that's my last name, W-E-I-T-Z, 20, you'll get 20% off a chili pad. So check it out and let's get back to this discussion. So what are some of the most important phytonutrients that help protect us from arsenic? I'm hesitant to say, okay, now I've got a table which shows the various uh, flavonoids, yeah, yeah. I, which ones have left. You listed on your slides, you had yeah. beta carotene, something called biocannon A, yes. uh, ECGC, neuringenin, fluoritin. Yes. 
<laughs> right, a long list, okay? Right. I don't know which are most important at this point. Right. I, I think okay. we're a little early on in the research. And when I see things like this, there's always this balance between get into the details um, and forgetting the forest for the trees, okay? So I, I rather than say, well, it's this particular flavonoid, okay, well, then people say, well, I guess I better get to take a vitamin with that. Well, okay, fine, you can do that, but I'd rather you just get the food that has it in it and all the other ones, because the other ones are important as well. Right. Now, where is arsenic found most? We've heard reports of arsenic in rice. Um, uh, we know that, uh, I don't know if they still do, but at one time they were feeding the chickens, uh, fruits feed, feed that had arsenic in it to help them grow faster. Right. So epidemiologically, the research is strongest with uh, arsenic in the water supply. And there's just there's just huge amounts of data on that area. Now, we also get arsenic from rice uh, because if rice is grown in water that has high levels of arsenic, it'll absorb it. It's just really efficient to absorb it. Like beans are really efficient at absorbing cadmium, for example. So you get in rice if the water supply is contaminated. Now, up until just recently, putting arsenic into the food supply of chickens was the standard of care because it made the chickens more resistant to, um, to uh, parasites and it made them plump up more and have more white meat, okay? But as the problems with arsenic became uh, more recognized, it now is no longer the standard of care. It doesn't mean farmers aren't doing it anymore and it's not exactly illegal, but up until recently, it's been a major source. The primary sources are water, rice, and chicken. But having said that, if you have an old wood climbing toy in your backyard or in your local park, well, the, those wood preservatives are very high in arsenic. So child growing those things is going to get arsenic contamination. If you're living near an industry that is leaking arsenic into the environment, well, you're going to have more arsenic in your body. Okay. But th those are the big three, but they're not the only three for sure. Right. Um... Uh, uh, and isn't it the case that farmers in certain states are allowed to uh, dump toxic waste on their farm as fertilizer and use uh, toxic wastewater to fertilize their farms in some cases? Um, I don't know. Uh, I would not be surprised by having seen that particular research. Okay. Um, so uh, another phytonutrient you mentioned in your presentation that I was not familiar with is something called tomatine, which is found in tomatoes. Right. Okay. So I, I use that as an example that um, when you're looking at the various molecules in the food supply, uh, which ones are being preserved? Uh, there was a great study I, I pointed out there where they looked at tomatoes grown in a greenhouse where half the tomatoes were grown with chemicals, half were grown with, uh, or grown organically. Okay, so it's really carefully controlled environment. They then looked over the whole year period of time, the level of the carotenoids and flavonoids in these foods. And what they found was that the chemically grown foods tended to maintain enough of those carotenoids and, and flavonoids to give the food its characteristic color and a bit of its natural taste, okay? But all the other ones were lost because they weren't considered important. Right. And uh, tomatine is uh, especially important for prostate. Right. So just, that's just one example I gave. So tomatine, important for, for uh, prostates. And there's research that was done looking at uh, giving people a tomatine, um, uh, for example, um, cell culture with prostate cancer cells. You put tomatine in there and the cancer cells can't grow. Okay. Right. Just, there's just so many examples. I'm hesitant to point out single ones like tomatine or, right. or quercetin or et cetera. Right. But I, I can give you a lot of examples where they're beneficial. But right. the and main thing is it's all of them, not just one. Right. And I, I think what you're pointing to is it's very easy to uh, look at some research to show that lycopene is preventative against prostate cancer, which comes from tomatoes. So I'm just going to take lycopene and then you know, you're missing out on the tomatine and other phytonutrients exactly. present in exactly. the natural foods like tomatoes. So right. while it's uh, perhaps not a bad idea to top off your, um, your dietary regimen with some concentrated levels of some of these phytonutrients, make sure you're getting plenty of the natural foods like tomatoes in your diet, because that's going to have a much more powerful effect than any one particular isolated phytonutrient. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm glad you're, you're reinforcing that topic. So let's say 
um, when you look at research comparing uh, tomatine to some drug, okay? Well, the drug's going to be more effective. Maybe the tom tomatine only help, helps like 10%, okay? So when you do research like that, we isolate out an individual factor. You might say, well, yeah, it's some benefit, but not very, very strong, and you know, the drug's way better. But when you realize there are hundreds of these things in the food supply, each has adds its one or two or 10% benefit. Now, all together, you have huge benefit without adverse effects. You know, these things are safe. Right. Okay. But it's very hard to study that, you know, yes. because usually when they study the benefits or effects of foods, they give people food frequency questionnaires and they're going to ask them, you know, how many times have you eaten tomatoes? Well, you know, it, they're probably going to include ketchup in that <laughs> or cheeseburger. And, uh, and then how do you know if the tomatoes are eating would most likely are going to be non-organic, non-heirloom, are yes. probably not going to have the right levels. Um, mm -hmm. So even despite that, it's, it's interesting. Despite the weakness of the food supply, it's still better than you know, to eat vegetables than not to eat vegetables. Right. But having well, said do. that, I mean, way better eating vegetables that are rich in nutrients and low in, low in toxins. Now, you know, you've mentioned hybrid farming. We've been talking about that. I'm not sure everybody knows what hybrid farming is. We've all heard about genetically modified crops and we're like, I don't want GMOs. I don't want GMOs. But talk a little more about hybrid farming. You know, you use the term I'm not aware of. What you maybe you better tell me what is hybrid farming? <laughs> well, you mentioned it. Uh, hybrid okay. farming is, um, as I understand it, you you can correct me. Is how we're um, 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 we're we're uh, mixing uh, different versions of plants to get the fruits and vegetables to be sweeter to for the tomatoes to look redder to you know. Oh, I, I see. I see. I use the term now. It, it wasn't clear where you're go, where, where going. Oh, with okay. 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 Uh, yeah. The the the, uh, the the intent is basically selection. Uh, just another right. way of saying selection. Right. Selecting food okay. for specific characteristics and losing everything else. Right. And people don't realize that this has been going on for a long time. And and, and as you're pointing out, um, you may be getting a tomato that's sweeter. Um, which may not be all that good for us because it may have a higher sugar content, but we're also, uh, you know, uh, losing some of the richness of tomatoes as found naturally. Yes. Yeah, and there's another aspect here, which actually is a little surprising, totally different from these factors we've been talking about. And that is when farmers are choosing seeds to grow, they're also choosing seeds that will grow foods that transport better that are more resistant to uh, breakdown uh, on the store shelves of things like this. Something I've been quite surprised is when we had to buy a store-bought version of something, you put in the refrigerator, it lasts for a week or two, it's fine. When you grow it when you're your own, you put in the refrigerator, they only last a few days. So the foods that you can grow yourself are much less um, robust, you might say, in terms of storage but that means they can use their resources to produce all the other molecules that are really good and um, aren't in those store-bought versions. Exactly. Yeah. Every once in a while, uh, my wife uh, will go to Costco and she'll buy some fruit or vegetable. Um, we usually buy everything organic from the mm -hmm. local co-op and from Whole Foods and wherever. But, um, you know, she'll, occasionally she'll buy some grapes from Costco. And she'll leave them out and they'll sit there for two weeks and they're not moldy. And I'm like, how is that even possible? These things yes. must be, have so many chemicals on them. Yes, yeah, exactly. Or they've been just so hybridized that they're really resistant. Well, you're paying a price for that. It's not, and it's not, the problem is the price we're paying for these highly hybridized and chemically grown foods, it's not obvious what the price is in terms of long-term health effects. But the research is now there. It's very, very clear. Right. Um, I know. You, I, I know you don't want to target these uh, phytonutrients too much, but mm -hmm. I, I want to mention a couple more before we wrap up. I wanted to mention quercetin, which yes. has incredible amount of benefits, and we've been hearing a lot about quercetin uh, during this pandemic because, among its other benefits, uh, quercetin is a um, zinc ionophore, and it helps get mm -hmm. zinc into the cells more. 
uh, as well as helping to protect lung tissue. But perhaps you can talk about uh, quercetin for a minute. Well, thanks. So it was actually the quercetin story, quercetin story that really cemented my interest in unimportant molecules. So the I won't get into the the the, uh, the whole or, line. Or by the way, is, are we supposed to pronounce it quercetin or quercetin? I've always pronounced it quercetin, but I'm, I'm not a linguist. I don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> but that's what most I and other people I know uh, d d describe it. So the I, I don't want to get too long a story, but just real quickly, a year ago when I was working with uh, uh, another uh, chiropractor, uh, Sam Sam um, uh, Yannick and uh, a naturopathic doctor, Kara Fitzgerald, and medical doctor, Helen Mezier, uh, we were looking at, well, what's the natural medicine approach to uh, COVID-19? And I was looking at the research, and I found this great study that showed that quercetin binds to the spike proteins in the coronavirus to make them more difficult to enter into the body. That's what really got me to dive deeply into this whole antiviral aspect of, of these flavonoids. So... And here's what's fascinating. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there's a research colleague of mine by the name of uh, Francesco Di Piero, who has a, a research lab in Italy where he has a, a, a number of um, uh, M, uh, masters and PhDs working with them, looking at the benefits of natural health products. One of the areas he just got accepted for publication was looking at quercetin on, with, for people with COVID-19. Just published two studies, clinical studies. The first study was 152 people with uh, COVID-19, half got quercetin and half got standard of care. Well, all got standard of care, half also got quercetin. They then looked at hospitalizations, greater than 50% reduction in hospitalization. And if they got hospitalized, greater than 50% reduction in length of hospitalization. Then you had another study just come out where they actually looked at, took people who had uh, COVID-19 uh, documented. They then measured their viral load and they gave half of them the quercetin. They decreased their viral viral load 80% uh, faster. So for example, after five days, 80% of the people on the quercetin, their viruses were gone versus only 20% of people who were uh, using the standard, uh, standard of care. So we're seeing now that, and again, these are early studies, uh, not fully controlled. Uh, uh, there's a potential commercial bias because he's a scientist, scientific consultant for the company that makes the product. Like you have to look at these, you know, be, be aware of those things. But nonetheless, it's exactly what we expected. Quercetin protects us from infections, viral infections like uh, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, amazing. Um, let's just hit on one more um, phytonutrient um, uh, uh, let's see, let's hit on pomegranate, which is uh, mm. a pretty amazing um, uh, food that has uh, an amazing, seems to have an amazing amount of benefits for prostate, for all kinds of uh, cardiovascular risk. So um, the other area of fascination with foods like pomegranate that are so high in these various carotenoids and flavonoids, particularly the flavonoids, is their antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects. So as you know, many, much of the damage from these viral infections, and like look at SARS-CoV-2, for example, uh, is the um, ongoing inflammation in the, in the microvasculature. It looks like a lot of these, these kind of these long haulers is because of inflammation in microvasculature. Well, what protects the microvasculature from inflammation? Carotenoids and flavonoids. So a lot of these things like pomegranate juice are really high in these molecules that protect the body from these infections. Mm -hmm. I'm actually right now working on developing a formula, uh, an antiviral formula. And, and, I was, and I'm considering, well, should I be putting in some flavonoids that aren't so antiviral, but really anti-inflammatory? So it, it's, it's important. Yeah, one lab test that may be an indicator of some of this uh, microvascular inflammation is myeloperoxidase and pomegranate mm. is an interesting modulator of that. Now, you said something interesting that we're not aware of. So you're saying myeloperoxidase is a good measure of microvasculature inflammation? Uh, I think it's an indicator, potentially, okay. of it. You know, okay. uh, unfortunately, we haven't really studied the microvascular as much. Right. We pretty much focus on the large vessels, yes. and that's where all the research is. But... Um, you know, there are a percentage of people, especially women, who end up having heart attacks that are at least partially related to the microvasculature, mm -hmm. and very little is is done to try to look at or measure that. And, you know, stenting is is all focused on the 
large vessels and, and you know, the way we image things is all mm. generally based on that. That that's an interesting suggestion. I'm gonna look into that because if in because we do know that the that information microvasculature is a big issue with the long haul. If we have a good measure like myeloperoxidize as an indicator of that inflammation of the my, small vessels, that'd be really helpful. I'm, I'm going to look into it. Thanks, okay. thanks for the suggestion. Do you, do you think the uh, clotting and inflammation in the microvasculature is a big is one of the big factors in the long hauler syndrome? Oh, absolutely. That's very, very clear. Uh, Scripps came out with a study uh, about a month ago, and they I think they uh, they they dove into it um, pretty pretty well. I think I think they made a very convincing case. Great. Excellent. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion, Dr. Prisano. Thank you so much for your time. Um, for Thanks for the invitation. Listeners and viewers who want to find out about your books um, and, uh, and whatever other programs you offer, where should they go to get more information? Well, what I offer these days are, are mainly the books that I write. Okay. So uh, just go, go to Amazon, put my name in, and my books will come up. So if you're interested in environmental medicine, for example, I've got a consumer book called The Toxin Solution. And for doctors, I co-authored a book called Clinical Environmental Medicine, where we show doctors how to uh, how toxins cause disease, how you diagnose them, how you get them out of the body. It's a very uh, comprehensive. And those who want to f- apply this body of knowledge to all healthcare problems, my textbook of natural medicine. You know, that was first published in 1985. It's- We're now in our fifth edition. <laughs> It's it sold 100,000 copies. 100, thank you. You should have a copy of that book. Well, it sold 100,000 copies uh, in, in four languages. So wow. it's helped establish a scientific foundation for these whole fields of naturopathic and chiropractic and integrative and functional medicine. We showed the research. The research is there, folks. This way of thinking about health uh, is, is very valid and it's been substantiated. Uh, on behalf of the functional medicine community, Dr. Prisorno, thank you so much for your lifetime of uh, achievements and contribution to the field. Well, thank you. Thank you, listeners, for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. Please take a- I'd also like to let everybody know that I now have a few openings for new clients for nutritional consultations. If you're interested, please call my office in Santa Monica at 310-395-3111. That's 310-395-3111. And take one of the uh, few openings we have now for a individual consultation for nutrition with Dr. Ben Weitz. Thank you and see you next week.